Welcome back, welcome back, one and all. I'm your host, Hop. You're on the Hoplite channel. And uh, if you are clicked on this video, you are here for Samurai Literature, Yagyu Munanori, Part 1. So uh, in the last uh, series um, of the Samurai Literature uh, pieces that I'm doing, uh, we concluded uh, the works of Takawan Soho who was a uh, Zen Buddhist monk in feudal Japan um, in the era of the Tokugawa shogunate. And as I said, uh, concluding with Takawan, we were going to move away from some of the more esoteric or theoretical ideas of Bushido and uh, segue into some of the writings of the samurai themselves. And we were going to begin with uh, a friend and... Um, uh, student of Takawan Soho's uh, Yagyo Munanori. And uh, we'll begin with uh, a, a brief bio of, of Yagyo, as I did with Takawan. And uh, we'll, we'll, then we'll move to the source material for this segment, which will be uh, his work, The uh, Life Giving Sword. So, anyway, uh, who was Yagyo Munanori? Well, we know he was born in 1571 AD in Japan, and he died in 1646. Um, not long after uh, his friend Takawan uh, uh, departed. Uh, we know that he was born into a samurai family, naturally. That's how he himself became a samurai. And he learned the art of the sword, katana, from his father, Yagyu Muniyoshi. Uh, Muniyoshi, um, you could almost dedicate a video to him entirely. It, as far as Japanese culture and history goes, uh, Yagyu um, Muniyoshi is where the art of Yagyu uh, Shinkage Ryu came from. And it's only because of his father, Muniyoshi, that Muni Muninori became so famous because he took his father's art of Yagyu uh, Shinkage Ryu and he perfected it. He became a master, um, literally uh, renowned throughout Japan for his mastery of the katana in his father's style. And uh, this style, Yagyu Shinkage Ryu, uh, is essentially translated to uh, Yagyu New Shadow School. And um, it's still practiced today. Uh, literally developed, and I believe, in 1580, somewhere in there, and still practiced in Japan today, and uh, one of the more popular styles of, of swordsmanship. But um, let's talk about Muninori. Uh, he adopted his father's style as a samurai uh, and um, perfected it. And um, this art became so well known, it was officially adopted by the Tokugawa shogunate. Uh, I believe it was uh, Iesu, uh, the Tokugawa Iesu shogun, who uh, learned of uh, Muniyoshi's art and wanted to adopt it as one of the two official art, uh, arts of the katana in Japan for the, that shogunate. And it was Muniyoshi's desire that his son, Muninori, become the instructor in the Tokugawa house uh, for this particular art of the katana. And that's what happened. Uh, Yagyu uh, Muninori himself became a hatamoto, which is a under the banners translation. Uh, he, that's kind of like a, uh, a nobility uh, rank that the shogun bestowed upon uh, Muninori. And it made him a daimyo. So he had uh, land holdings because of this promotion in his hometown of, of Yagyu uh, Prefecture. And he was the instructor of uh, the shogun uh, Hiritada. And later the advisor to the shogun uh, Imitsu, the son of Hiritada, who was the son of I Iesu. So uh, both uh, Muniyoshi and Muninori, uh, through three shogunates, uh, they were instrumental uh, in that period. And as I mentioned in the Takawan Soho uh, video, it was uh, because of Yagyu Muninori's influence uh, as an advisor to the Tokugawa shogunate Imitsu that he was able to uh, negotiate the recall of Takawan Soho from exile after Imitsu's father, Hidetada, had banished him to northern Japan. And Imitsu um, would sit out and listen uh, as Muninori and Soho would discuss Zen Buddhism 
and Bushido, uh, a samurai speaking to a monk, a monk speaking to a samurai. And Amitsu would gain much wisdom uh, listening to these two men have dialogue uh, in Edo after Soho returned. So uh, because of what was going on in Japan, I said this was like, these were the halcyon days of the samurai. The samurai in this period, uh, they pretty much were at their apex as far as uh, their influence and um, their presence. They were roughly 10% of the uh, Japanese population. So what happened? Well, Takwan wrote his letters to Minoru, the Unfettered Mind, uh, another famous samurai who I'm going to get to in the latter part of this series, Miyamoto Musashi, wrote The Book of the Five Rings. So I believe Mununori felt like he had to leave his mark as well. So Mununori, in 1632, wrote his book, uh, The Life-Giving Sword. And this was his manual of the way, as he understood Bushido, as he understood his father's art, and as, it, as he was perfecting both of these while learning Zen Buddhism from his good friend, uh, Taco on Soho. So that's a brief history of Yagi Munanori. Um, yeah, legendary samurai without a doubt. Uh, his father's craft of the katana is still practiced today. Uh, in this period in the Tokugawa Shogunate, it was uh, the, the art uh, within the royal court. So you could say that, that his father and he were more or less rock stars because Everybody wanted to know how they did what they did, and they would invite them uh, to the court to see them practice their martial arts and to see them uh, teach it as well. And there's, a, there's a famous story, I believe, that um, Munanori uh, actually, uh, during one of the sieges that the Tokugawa family was uh, launching against a rival family, uh, he defended uh, the uh, shogun um, from uh, attackers and the, the legend goes that they just saw this samurai of middle age calm cool standing there with his katana waiting uh, and assuming that the, the the attack would come as if he had anticipated it for weeks and had just always been standing there and then when the attackers came for the shogun uh, Munanori drew his katana and with effortless ease cut down seven of the attackers so uh, he definitely was more than just a, uh, a nerd. Uh, he, he practiced what he preached. Uh, he was a samurai. He was a warrior, a bushi, in the true sense of the word. And he was also uh, a great mind and a great thinker. So like Takawan, who was born in a samurai family but chose to become a monk, Yagyu chose to become a samurai, being born into a samurai family, chose to take up his father's school of the sword and without a doubt became a master of it. So let's read uh, from uh, some excerpts uh, right now in The Life-Giving Sword, and we'll talk about it as I go along. Um, this is the book right here. Again, uh, if you're into samurai literature, you got to have this one. Life-Giving Sword, Secret Teachings from the House of the Shogun by Munanori. All right, we'll go to page 68. And this is in his chapter uh, entitled The Death-Dealing Sword. And Mudanoi wrote, In ancient times it was said, Weapons are instruments of ill omen. The way of heaven finds them repugnant. The way of heaven is to use them only when necessary. The reason for this is that the way of heaven is a way that brings life, while instruments that kill are on the contrary truly ill omened. Thus they are considered repugnant because they are contrary to the way of heaven. Nevertheless, it goes on to say that using weapons and killing people when this cannot be avoided is also the way of heaven. If you would ask what this means, it is that flowers bloom and greenery accompanies, accompanies them in the spring breezes, but the leaves fall and trees wither when autumn frosts arrive. This is the judgment of the way of heaven. There is reason in striking down something that is replete. A man may ride his good fortune and commit evil, but you strike him down when that evil is replete. Thus, it may be said that using weapons is also the way of heaven. There are times when 10,000 people suffer because of the evil of one man. Therefore, in killing one man's evil, you give 10,000 people life. In such ways, truly the sword that kills one man will be the blade that gives others life. Okay. Well, this shouldn't be too hard to understand, but I think it definitely... Um, 
explains the um, philosophy of Yagi Munonori as a samurai, as someone trying to make his way through life as a bushi, as an instructor to uh, the shoguns and their advisors, but also as someone who may be called upon uh, to use his sword to deal death. And he did. As I mentioned that story, he cut down seven men who came to attack the shogun and did it according to the uh, accounts of what happened effortlessly. It was almost as if he, he moved through these men like wind. Um, and the way he looked at it was, well, the way of heaven forbids the use of weapons because it takes life. Whereas the way of heaven is to give life, to breathe life into creation. So the weapons as instruments of dealing death are repugnant to heaven. And he says, yes, but they are permissible in only one way. And that is do, do, to preserve life greater than the death it takes. In other, in other words, if the killing of one man whose life has become given over to evil and replete with wickedness, if cutting him down restores life to a hundred or thousands or tens of thousands of people, you can say that this weapon is, is in keeping with the way of heaven. So... A lot of people might say, that, well, he's just rationalizing this because he's chosen the samurai lifestyle. He's chosen to perfect his father's art. So, of course, he would say that using a weapon must be good in some sense because why else would he choose this way of life? But despite maybe his bias towards this, you can't argue with the logic of uh, the quotations in these excerpts. Life can be used... Uh, for wickedness, if nothing, if nothing else, weapons are implemented for the destruction and the taking of life. However, if weapons are used in their limited, in their limited respects to take life from evil men that have become replete with wickedness, so as to deal death to the wicked and to give life to the chaste, to the pure, to the good, to the innocent, well then that is in keeping with the way of heaven. And I think he was trying to instruct his samurai who would be watching uh, him teach and reading his words after his death that this martial art is nothing to be taken lightly. That if you intend to kill, if you intend to take life, you must understand that this is not in keeping with the way of heaven. Unless you use your weapons and you use your training as a bushi in the ways of bushido that the death you deal must be for a greater good and that your death-dealing sword must only be used if it is also a life-giving sword. Hence the title of the book. But we'll get to that chapter later. Okay, let's move on. We go now to page 74. Yes. And Yagyu Munonori said, The Great Learning says, Extend your knowledge to all things. To extend means to do so exhaustively. To extend your knowledge, then, is to have nothing said to be unknown. If you exhaustively know the principles of all things, there is nothing remaining unknown and nothing that cannot be done. If you do not know all things, you still harbor doubts. And when you doubt something, that thing will not leave your mind. If you come to the end of a matter with the principle clearly understood, there will be nothing at all in your mind. This is called exhausting knowledge and exhausting the things of this world. When there is nothing at all left in your mind, everything becomes easy to do. The study of all ways is done for the sake of making a clean sweep of your mind. Because in the beginning, a man knows nothing at all. He has nothing at all in his mind. When you perform an action, you will be in harmony with what you have learned without even being aware of it. When you have exhaustively learned the various practices and techniques and made great efforts in discipline training, there will be action in your arms, legs, and the body, but none in your mind. You will have distanced yourself from training, but you will not be in opposition to it, and you will have freedom in whatever techniques you perform. You yourself will be unaware of where your mind is, and neither demons nor heresies will be able to find it. Training is done for the purpose of reaching this state. With successful training, Training falls away. This is the secret principle toward which all ways progress. Okay. What is he saying in that massive passage there? Well, what he is saying is that to be considered proficient in the ways 
of Bushido, of Zen Buddhism, of ministerial uh, government, as a shogun would be uh, walking the way. Um, to be considered a master of these arts, you must do so with the intent to exhaust your knowledge of it. And that is to pursue all avenues, to pursue all opportunities to increase your knowledge in this way so that when it comes time for you to practice this way in terms of uh, danger or in terms of great importance, as in I need a samurai right now and I need him to do what is uh, most sacred to his art and that is to use his sword to give life to many and to cut down few and deal them death. Well, you want that samurai to say he has exhausted all of his knowledge, to say that when he has exhausted and learned the various practices and techniques and made great efforts and disciplined training, there will be action in his arms, legs, and body. And his mind will literally be able to go through the practices of his art, of Bushido, without even knowing he is doing it. And some people in the modern sense would call this muscle memory. And there's another fantastic quote by a samurai who, I, his name escapes me now, but I will look it up later. And he says that the art of reaching practice and thereby perfection is not doing something until you get it right. Perfection is doing something so often that you cannot get it wrong. And what that means is that to do something right once, twice, three times, 10 times, okay, very well. But to do something where you have exhausted your knowledge that you cannot possibly get it wrong, that is perfection. And that is the Zen-like state that you must reach as a samurai in your Bushido. And that is the way that always must progress, is that to do something so often with technique, with virtue uh, at your side, that you know your mind can literally step outside your body and your body will just take over because your mind is controlling it but completely unaware of what's, what it's doing because it has done it right so often there is no other alternative but for it to do it right again. So this correction, this, this Bushido that you take upon you uh, as you walk the way of the samurai, you must do so exhaustively. And to have this as your frame of mind that you will not rest until you could say you've exhausted all of your knowledge into practice. Uh, this, this is the only way uh, that a samurai should look at his craft as something that must be exhausted. And I'm sure as Yagyu and Taco and Soho would say, this is the correct path because as you progress and as you find new avenues to exhaust your art, a new avenue will uh, show itself. And the practice will begin again. Okay. Last reading. We go to page 92. Yagyu said, The man who has nothing at all in his breast is a real man of the way. Having nothing in his breast when he does something, it is done with ease, no matter what arises. The breast of a man of the way is like a mirror. It does nothing and is perfectly clear. Thus, he has no mind, and in all things lacks nothing. This is the ordinary mind. A man who accomplishes everything with this ordinary mind is said to be a master. When you have continuously made great efforts and have accumulated discipline without really noticing, you will have left aside the thought of doing things well and will have attained the realm of no mind, no thought. No mind, however, is not a state of having no mind at all. It is simply your ordinary mind. Okay. Again, that, uh, that's quite Zen for, uh, for a samurai, uh, Yagi Munonori, to opine on. Uh, the, the man who has nothing at all in his breast is a man of the way. And the man of the way has no mind. But this is not the... As he's saying, this was not the um, state of having no conscience, no thought. It goes back to the muscle memory uh, of being so in tune with the way that you do not have to think about winning or losing or surviving or dying or being embarrassed or dishonored 
or winning great glory, your ordinary mind will take over and that it, you will become instinctual in your actions because you have trained yourselves, uh, yourself in the uh, virtues of Bushido. You have given yourself up to this art. You neither care about victory nor defeat. You neither fear death nor a dishonorable life. You are simply going to move into conflict if it comes, or if you are in peacetime, move about your day-to-day -day life as though you are a man of ordinary mind. You have the no mind, the no thought. Everything comes to you is brand new. You do not have apprehensions or fears. You do not have desires or passions. This is the mind of no mind. Uh, and with this absence of these thoughts, you can practice the virtues and Bushido uh, more efficiently. And this was what uh, Yagi was saying uh, to uh, the Bushi, the samurai who, who would later come to read this work, is that you must take upon this art of the katana with a mind of the no mind. Do not believe you will be cut. Do not believe that you will cut someone. Do not believe you have the ability to parry. Do not believe that your opponent will parry your sword. Give up these thoughts. Give up these anticipations. Embrace the mind of no mind. As a Zen Buddhist uh, would also say, uh, the contemplation of conscience can only begin when you give up conscious thought. Yeah. <laughs> right? Okay. All right. Uh, this will conclude part one of uh, Yagi Munanori um, for the life-giving sword. We'll uh, dive into part two uh, in the next one, and we'll talk more about this uh, incredible samurai, uh, the work he left uh, to his students and to his uh, uh, posterity, and how uh, the, the nation of Japan was definitely shaped by um, the contributions of this family, and in particular, uh, Munenori himself. Okay, as always, I uh, appreciate you coming by and giving this a watch. Thumbs up if you're liking it. Uh, subscribe if you really like it and you're liking the series and the channel. Uh, share it uh, with anybody you think uh, might find it uh, intriguing. And we will see you next time uh, for part two of Munanori. Till then, take it easy.